our panel on mobile payments in practice. These are app publishers who are have solved, um, have created a solution that that includes mobile payments as either the primary service or a, an extension of that service. Some pretty exciting technology on the stage, and um, want to leave plenty of time for questions from the audience. So let me start it off, Elsa, and just take it from there. I'm Elsa Broker. I'm an attorney with Pillsbury, based in Austin. And I focus on payments companies and fintech companies, anywhere from startups to kind of your bigger, more established companies. And I'm going to let each of these guys on our panel kind of introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about their companies. David? Hi. Um, my name is David Weber. I'm here representing the New York City Food Truck Association. And I have to say, first of all, it's really flattering to be at a place like this. Um, not that long ago, street food was entirely relegated to the street. Um, so it's exciting. It's a, a liminal sort of dynamic space. Uh, and there's been a lot of experimentation, uh, both from the culinary side and from the technology side, uh, to connect with customers and make uh, the ease of doing business on the street even better. Um, so I guess that I'm here more as a, a use case, uh, as a little test case for this environment on the street uh, and how to make that um, mobile payments easy for, for customers that want to get their food fast. I'm Alex. Great to be here, everybody. Um, and just to clear up any confusion, Elsa's my wife. It's very strange that she's a payments-related lawyer, um, and I've never quite had this experience where my wife moderates a panel that I speak at. I do speak from time to time at conferences, but uh, this is a special experience. So uh, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is uh, Peter Braxton, um, <clears throat> former Air Force pilot and banker at Credit Suisse, turned app developer, uh, invented a app called Jump Rope, Jump Rope allows you to uh, skip the line at nightclubs, uh, museums, airports, restaurant reservations uh, by paying. So you pay a premium. And what we're actually selling is kind of loyalty uh, a la carte. No longer do you have to be you know, the Platinum Club member or you know, the Admirals Club. You can just say, hey, what's going on tonight? Look down on your phone and say, I want to get into that place. And you know, what it comes down to is, is economic. So we use dynamic pricing. Um, to change the price of what it, how much it costs on a Friday night at 11.30 versus 11.38 or 1 a.m. Um, and we, we let you skip the, skip the line. My name is uh, Lawrence. Uh, I'm with a company called Park Mobile. And uh, before I say what I do, I just want to ask one question. How many of you guys are carrying change at the moment? Change. Change? <laughs> More than two bucks? Okay, that gives you like uh, an hour, <laughs> less than an hour parking on the street. So what I do is enable you to pay for parking through a smartphone. And we do that in more than 570 locations in the US, uh, including big cities such as LA, um, <coughs> Indianapolis, Houston, DC, but also in Europe, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and Mexico. And thanks for being here and having me as a, as a panelist. I appreciate the opportunity. It's called Farewell to the Cash Register. So I wanted to ask kind of a quick poll of the audience. How many of you guys have used, um, a, performed a mobile payment in the last year? In the last year, performed a mobile payment. Can you hear me now? But how about in the last month? Last week? Today? That's our okay. Past hour. Past hour. So hopefully this panel kind of addressed some of the issues of why maybe some of you have never performed a mobile payment, or maybe once the past year, or maybe why some of you all are doing it on a daily basis and incorporate it into your life. Is this easier? Can you hear me better now? OK. So we're just going to dive right in. And you know, each one of your businesses has um, focused <coughs> on an industry where that could benefit from mobile payments. So I want to kind of hear from each one of you how you identified that opportunity in that industry. I guess, Lawrence, we can start with you. Well. I don't know how you see it, but nobody, at least I don't like to pay for parking, and I can only assume that you don't like to pay for parking either. But if you have to pay for parking, you better make it as seamless and as frictionless as possible. And uh, that's what caused the, and sparked the idea to uh, start Park Mobile already uh, 12, 13 years ago in Europe. Um, we saw that uh, rates started to increase and that people had more and more complaints and issues <coughs> by feeding meters, walking to meters. They didn't carry enough change anymore. So we thought, how handy and nice would it be if you could just use your cell phone, 
to call a, at that time, tin can voice IVR, and then start your parking transaction, um, and, and then pay after a month. So we invoiced them. That was in Europe in the good old days. Um, and, and this solution um, you know, grew and, and became more mainstream. And uh, today in America, 87% uh, of, of all our transactions are conducted through mobile apps. Uh, and we have more than, uh, more than a million transactions every month, again, in 570 locations. And uh, we have 1.7 million members, and they just love the solution. Um, so it's growing rapidly, and uh, we're very excited. Peter? Sure. Um, <clears throat> again, it starts out with a problem, and I think the problem is um, how many people in this room like to stand in line, right? I mean, you're always wondering what's going on ahead of you, what, what's the, you know, especially in the wintertime, it's cold outside. If you're trying to get access to something, um, uh, some people are willing to pay. And so what we, uh, th this originally happened, my brother's a neurosurgeon, uh, he's also in the military, he's in the Air Force, and um, he was deploying to Afghanistan, and he calls me up one day, I'm in my little office in Chicago, and says, well, what are you doing tonight? I said, are oh, you coming to Chicago? He said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm my date to get deployed to Afghanistan moved up a month. Do you want to go to Vegas tonight? And so I said, Sh sure, let's go. So I left my office, got on a plane, I show up. My little brother's there, he's there. My brother, uh, his, his surgeon, his fellow surgeons are there. And they're all, we're all going to see him off. We, we do the steaks, the scotch, and then we go to a nightclub. And if anyone's been to excess in Las Vegas, I mean, it looks like somebody pulled the fire alarm, right? And everybody's coming. Now, all these people are trying to get in at the same time. And uh, what I ended up having to do was spend what I call so social currency, social currency, right? I had to call some people that I knew and eventually got hooked up with a VP of entertainment at the Win on Court. And he's like, oh, Peter, not that I'm an important guy, but you know, Peter, right away. And so somebody came out of the club, found me, and brought me and my brother and all his friends in. And then guess what, I'm the hero. I'm, I'm just the hero, right? I'm the hero. So I, I, my brother left for Afghanistan, a six-month de deployment, and I went home and I said, I'm going to fix this problem. Here's, here's the problem. Uh, all you need is information and money, right? So how much is it going to take, and who do I need to pay this to to get past this line and get in? And this thing, I've invented nothing new. This has been going on for centuries, right? You slip the guy some money. Somebody probably did it last night, right? And uh, he's like, right this way. And so what, what every organization wants is a premium paying customer. What I discovered was that everyone's carrying a smartphone. And so now we can display that information to you. We can give you, uh, in exchange for some economics, uh, access to whatever you're looking for. OK. Alex, I know you have a good, a good founding story of the, um, how Tabbed Out started. I've been wondering how, in the, how to get into Club XS in Vegas for years. That's a great, you know. a great story. Um, tabbed out was pretty simple. Guy walks into a bar. Um, working on these girls all night. Finally gets a girl. He's talking to her. He says, hey, let's go grab breakfast at Denny's. She's like, cool. He goes, I'm going to go close my tab. He walks over to the bar, 25 people deep. Five minutes later, 10 minutes later. Finally, she, her friends come up to her, whisper in her ear, just give me your car. Let's get out of here. So she beats it. Here's my card. He's like, man, why won't this device talk to that point of sale terminal? And that's where he comes up with the founding idea for the, store, for, for the company. So he's a security guy. Uh, I have a lot of payments background. We put, uh, put the company together. And we allow uh, uh, a mobile phone to talk to uh, almost all the POS systems in the US today. We've been, done technical integrations with 75% of the U.S. hospitality market to open and persist a tab in bars and restaurants. So the, uh, he does call her, and uh, three years later, they end up getting married. That's the story. So. It's pretty sweet. Well, David, I know your situation is you know, somewhat different. I can't different. believe I'm in the middle of this. I don't know. Um, I'm not that girl. But. Um, uh, well, uh, basically, uh, the food trucks are users of all these technologies, and I actually, I actually wish there was a better way to pay for parking here in New York City. Uh, we basically go to the bank all the time and literally pay the bank premium to get rolls of quarters so that we have it on the dashboard and uh, we're ready to go to feed the meters in real time. But um, 
the primary use uh, across the, the food trucks here in New York City uh, is basically um, looking at different ways to ease uh, transactions with customers. So um, there's been street vending in New York since New York was New Amsterdam. Um, people hawking on the street. Pearl Street was literally named for oyster hawkers. Uh, everyone is familiar with the iconic hot dog cart. But uh, something happened in 2008, 2009 where you start to get uh, this blossoming of innovation and basically branded food coming to the streets. Uh, schnitzel, lobster rolls, um, dumplings, uh, all sorts of fun food from, from all over the place. And so there's basically this, this push to make the food better um, and to make the experience for customers better. Um, and one of the challenges of being on the street is there's not many things you can control. And when you walk into a restaurant, you can control the lighting, you can control um, the vibe in terms of like the, the experience, uh, like you know, what sort of carpet there is. On the street, you're sort of stuck with the street. Um, you get one person there, and then you know, how you pay becomes a very influential factor. Um, more and more people just aren't carrying that much cash, um, and you lose transactions uh, if you ask people to go grab money from an ATM, and you lose um, the opportunity to potentially upsell uh, if you're working within the constraint of what's in someone's pocket. So, um, we've worked with a lot of people from the beginning, Square, PayPal, Level Up, um, you know, basically most of the players out there have been uh, talking with us, so we've, we've tried a lot of different stuff along the way. So you guys, it's just all those kind of different partners, you don't necessarily partner with one specific one, how do you facilitate that? Yeah, so, that um, in 2011, we started the Food Truck Association primarily as an advocacy organization to work with the city to improve the rules and regulations. And um, by having this network of about 95 vendors um, and this really specific use case, um, because food trucks are very well engaged socially vis-a-vis -vis a, a lot of other restaurants, it, it, I think it becomes like an interesting test case for someone to come in, like Square, and they're like, okay, let's start with these trucks because we know they have fans, we see this guy has 30,000 Twitter followers, like what, what can we do in this microcosm? Um, so they come to us and we can you know, facilitate that conversation with 95 trucks at once and sort of coming up with tests to sort of see what works, what are the constraints. Um, early on, one of the constraints with Square, for instance, was basically speed of service. Like, uh, the trucks had to hire literally an extra person to just swipe because it wasn't as sturdy as you know, a restaurant POS. The, 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 the more delicate nature of the, the plug-in um, meant that you know, doing 200 covers an hour, they just couldn't keep up. So you know, that's, that's you know, the learning of the street is the practical applications of how people actually use things. Okay, and that kind of comes to my next question. So is the association focused more on consumer experience or merchant experience, or is it a mixture of both? Um, I think it's a, it's a mixture of both. I mean, obviously it has to work for the consumer. Um, I, I would say that that's sort of the first hurdle. I don't know, different, different businesses have different constraints. Um, so some people want to see their money the next day or whatever the sort of standards are that they used to get. It's like, how fast is my stuff coming through? Um, if I'm going to use uh, uh, this tool both as a point of sales and as uh, a credit card processing tool. Um, so you know, what sort of functionality is there? But then ultimately, if, if it's not improving um, the speed of the transaction, if it's not improving the average sales per guest, then Ultimately, you know, what, what is that one and a half, two percent premium worth? Um, because cash is, cash is king, yeah. Like if you can make cash work, then you always want to make cash work. Okay. And that kind of was one of my main questions I want to discuss on this panel because we talk a lot about the consumer experience, making it frictionless. And there's, on the one hand, you're trying to, you know, build mobile payment awareness for consumers. But I think there's also this challenge of building that awareness to merchants and providing a benefit to merchants saying, you know, so that they will tell consumers, yes, pay with your mobile phone. And so I know um, I'd like to hear from kind of you all as well, you know, how, what benefits are you providing to merchants? Is that, kind of, is that an obstacle that you're facing in your business just as you're trying to attract consumers? Lawrence, Peter, sure, Alex, I can, either one I, and you I can talk in? about that, at least in this space. Um, what we're doing is actually capturing the economics that would normally be left on the sidewalk, right? So a guy like myself or, or, or you, Alex, you know, you walk up and you'll see this big line, and then there's a little mental calculation, right? A, 
you know, what's it going to take? How long is this going to take? How much is how much money is it going to take? Well, if we again lower those hurdles to payments and get it uh, so someone can just press a button, send the message to the person that is the decision maker. Um, perhaps we can engage you and capture those economics. Those economics then we transfer to the gatekeeper, the guy at the door, or the owner, or somebody who's in charge, uh, who otherwise wouldn't normally see that money, because it would then walk away and go somewhere else. Obviously, there's, there's heavy competition for your entertainment dollars. Um, and, in, and at least in this case, uh, uh, the margins are very thick. The margins are very thick, because it's just found money. It's, it's money that they otherwise wouldn't have seen. And, and I think the pitch then is, Look, if this guy's willing to pay 50 or $75 a head to, to just walk through the door, he's probably going to spend more once he gets inside. He's not just going to sit there and kind of look around at each other. He's going he's gonna to spend some money at your establishment because it's a special occasion. He's with somebody special. He's with a, an old uh, frat brother from college or, 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 or a client, right? I mean, who, who wouldn't want to spend 45 extra minutes uh, with a client and kind of, again, buy that cool, that cool factor? So I think all through the ecosystem, and the value chain from the consumer, if we lower the hurdles, uh, to the person who's capturing the economics, to the entertainment, right? It's, uh, it's kind of a win-win-win. My experience is that um, merchants are a very powerful ally in our uh, quest to implement mobile payments and parking. Uh, obviously, um, as you said, cost, uh, consumer experience is very important. It must be seamless, uh, so you solve an issue. but. Uh, a lot of merchants are very afraid of uh, paid parking. They think that um, uh, the moment you implement paid parking or you increase rates, that people will not show up. I will tell you that's not the case, as study has proved. So as long as there's parking available, or people think there is parking available, then people will show up. And uh, what we do is we offer uh, validation uh, for merchants. So merchants can provide promo codes to their clients that gives them the first hour off, or even free parking if they spend more than uh, 50 bucks. Those kind of the, the the kind of tools that we provide them. This is all very seamless and and, and simply uh, implemented, and uh, they're very happy with it. You know, you, you just need to think about it and help them, and that helps us sell the solution to consumers as well. So it cuts both ways. So I think from Tap Down's perspective, <clears throat> you actually have to solve for the merchant um, value prop before you actually really solve for the consumer value prop. The consumer value prop for full service hospitality, when you raise your, I mean, it's broken, right? If you ever have to ask your waitress for your bill, there's a problem. There's a friction point for a consumer that you won't have to incent people by very much to get them to change their payment behavior. As opposed to some of our friends in NFC situations, it's actually, you know, harder to push three or four buttons on your phone to get the QR code to read in front of a scanner Swiping a card, tapping your card is still pretty quick. It's not broken there. So you got to, uh, the consumer value prop for us is always pretty simple, which, man, everybody's had that frustration. The merchant value prop was the one that you, um, that we really spent a lot of time on the front end coming up with. And merchants spend lots of money on loyalty, and email marketing campaigns. They're not very good marketers in full service hospitality, thankfully. That's where we come in. But why don't they ever say, I prefer, Visa, MasterCard, Discover, they slightly don't like American Express because of the interchange rates, but they don't ever tell you what to pay with. Why? Because there's nothing in it for a merchant. Well, they spend all this money on these loyalty systems trying to capture customer records. Um, they don't get anything out of the payment mechanism that you use from a consumer. So it's a pretty simple value prop for them. You say, look, if you prefer tabbed out, all of a sudden, your customer record and your database is filled. You have a CRM platform all because you just said, hey, we prefer tabbed out here. And from a tabbed out perspective, you can put any card in your wallet. We work with all the card associations, all the alternative payment providers. We are card and payment source agnostic. But we give merchants a value prop to say, hey, prefer tabbed out, because now all of a sudden I connect with you. I can send you loyalty. I can send you coupons. I can drive better yield. I know what to order, because I'm grabbing SKU level data of what occurs at the POS. And that is a huge value prop for merchants. And they spend a lot of money trying to gather these records and tablet-based loyalty systems jacked into the back of their POS system. It's hard. But if you give them something super simple by just say prefer tabbed out, all of a sudden their CRM database starts exponentially expanding. So that's, uh, we spent a lot of time early on at tabbed out really thinking about a value prop and an easy marketing platform for merchants, all just completely integrated with their POS magically by just having somebody make one mobile payment. And then the last part for the merchant value prop that we had to solve was 
uh, server tips. And so servers are the ones where we really need that megaphone to go off. And so now that we've had you know, millions of transactions through the tabbed out system, um, average tips are actually 24% higher if a consumer makes a mobile payment than a credit card tip. So it goes pretty quick when you go into a server and you say, I can give you a 24, 25% raise today. You want to do that? All you have to do is say, hey, we take tabbed out here. And you're starting to see the virality go uh, in our usage statistics now. Okay, thanks, Alex. And um, you touched on offers and loyalty, and I think in a lot of these types of conferences, people talk about loyalty, rewards, offers. That's how you really get consumers to maybe start using mobile payments or to retain customers. Um, and I'd like to hear from some of you guys maybe how you've incorporated loyalty, offers, rewards, or some of those things from the consumer side and the merchant side, and kind of have you seen that drive um, customer acquisition or retention in, in your businesses? I don't know, is that, is that part of something that yeah, you guys Yeah, you know, do? I think, it, I mean, it's, it's a very typical idea in hospitality, you know, like, come 10 times, we'll give you something for free, right? And uh, there's, like, very low-tech starting solutions for that, where it's like, here's your punch card, come back every week. Uh, the problem with that is, like, it's very easy to find a hole puncher that's the same shape as the one you have, and then all of a sudden you're like, this guy every day is coming with the same thing. Um, and then, you know, the other thing I think uh, what Alex is alluding to is, like, we, we have no idea who our customers are. So, um, basically, the, what it comes down to, um, I, I recently moved from working on the streets in a food truck to, uh, to running a, a dot-com, and it's, it's so satisfying to know who my customers are. It's, like, it feels so empowering, um, like, just even, like, going through, like, simple analytics tools, it, it's, it's so meaningful, and you have this amazing sense of control and knowledge, um, whereas, you know, usually it's just like, if you can keep the same person at the register every day, and you're like, oh, that's my, you know, you're my regular, you get, you know, coffee with two creams and extra sugar, or whatever it is, um, like, being able to, like, abstract that out into larger patterns and larger trends is, like, very useful in terms of scaling and growing a business, so that it, it's definitely persuasive uh, and interesting from the merchant perspective. Lawrence or Peter, anybody? Well, in, in, I think in my case, um, we're trying to monetize demand. And, you know, in the case where supply exceeds demand, you, you can lower the price point, uh, shift the price curve. You know, I'm not trying to get too technical here, but. Um, and it offer these incentives, and people will then make a decision, probably, to push them over the edge. Um, this is the opposite of Groupon, right? So we're not looking, we're not, we, the price goes up. Let me, let me assure you, <laughs> let me sh I've, I've watched it, right? So it's dynamic pricing. When somebody buys the price, there's an algorithm that will change the price, and it will move it up, up, up. And there are people that will pay 500 or, or 600 or $700 to walk through a door uh, because they don't want to stand outside anymore. Or they, you know, they, they want that experience. And so there's not a lot of, you know, incent my problem is how do, I, how do I make them know that it's available, right? So marketing, 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 it's very expensive. And um, that education of the consumer uh, can be difficult at times unless you kind of build it so a three-year-old, you know, or maybe a smart dog, like a border collie, can figure it out, right? You can put his paw in it, Oof, okay, let me, get, you know, let me go through the door. Um, and that's how I build, that's how I, I dress everything, is UI, UX, number one. U user experience, user interface, number one. The rest of the stuff we can figure out on the back end, that's not important. But, you know, when you're charging somebody 60, 70, 100, $500 to get access to something, there can be zero hiccups at all. And they have to have, you know, an enchanting experience where after that's done, they're telling everybody. I mean. It, and, and, you know, I have some more stories I can share afterwards about just that enchantment. And they would come up and they would call me and say, that was, that was miraculous, right? Like, um, let me give you some money <laughs> because this is going somewhere. Well, speak a little bit more about that. How, you know, you know most of you, you're all startups. You've got limited resources. How do I know that Jump Rope exists? How do I know that I can use Park Mobile in Atlanta to pay? You know, that's a huge struggle for, you know, you got limited resources, you're spending a lot on development, you know, how do you build that awareness of, you know, how do I know that a restaurant out there takes tabbed out? Well, if I, if I can say something about that, it's, it's, you need to be very inventive and, uh, you know, resources are scarce, you're absolutely right. My shareholders will not fund until uh, the end of times. 
But um, there's a lot of good things that we can use. It's not only social media with a lot of followers and likes on Twitter and Facebook, but it's also a lot of free publicity and, and share um, a lot of information through municipal channels. And what we do is we like to champion municipalities so that they can become the champions of smart parking and can, um, you know, can tell a political story about the good results, revenue increases, um, and, and other type of, of positive news that they can bring to the table. So we see that we can leverage our relationships and they become more like a an, an PR, marketing partner for us. And that is the way we try to approach it. So be very inventive and, and try to use your client base, partner base, as an alternative channel for, for marketing and awareness. For Jump Rope, um Again, it's a work in progress, and, and we're rebuilding some, some things on the back end. But what we're, we're really concentrating now on is uh, curating the community. Right? So the community of people who use Jump Rope are premium paying customers. Um, and we have, just like uh, Uber does, we have a rating system where right? you can rate your experience on the front end. And then again, the person who accepts that kind of receipt, um, which it's an animated receipt, so it's not even like you don't have to scan anything. It just kind of moves around. Um, and the, the door guy can, can then say, you know, this was a nice transaction. It was pleasant. The guy was nice. Um, and I let him in, and he's happy now. So uh, he can rate, that, again, that customer. And I think we're building a community where it's just kind of self-contained and curated. And we're not, I'm not looking for, you know, scale to a gazillion users. Because it's very difficult. It's extremely, extremely hard to do that. Uh, what I'm looking for is just this crop of premium paying customers. And I think that that list, that data, their shopping hat, that's very valuable to anybody. It could be valuable to, to Neiman Marcus or Lexus or Rolex, right? But at the end of the day, um, that's the kind of segment that I'm going after. And so as far as like acquisitions concerned, it's, it's word, of, word of mouth, right? How was your experience? It was great. I got in, spent some more time with the client. We closed the deal. You know, use, use jump rope the next time you need to get in that restaurant. Alex? So we're sitting at over 6,000 locations today, and I can tell you we still don't have it figured out. You try to give merchants a value prop to say we prefer tabbed out. You try to give servers a value prop, give them a 25% raise. Um, and we don't have the resources, nor do I want to raise that kind of capital to go influence consumers that with Super Bowl ads and billboards and people on uh, every street corner saying use tabbed out. So our strategy has really been partnering with brands buy my stuff, not the other guy's stuff. Since I know what your um, likes and preferences are, I know that you like Bud Light, not Coors Light, Miller Coors would love to send you an offer in the app to get you to change your payment behavior. Likewise, with um, Pay With Me, which is our other category of partners, um, use Google Wallet, not American Express. And we uh, may, may some of you may have gotten an email from Google, but they sent an email out to 30 million consumers saying if you download Tabbed Out and use Tabbed Out, and, uh, you'll get, uh, use Google Wallet and Tabbed Out, excuse me, you'll get seven bucks off any, tab, any Tabbed Out location. So we try to ride the publicity and the marketing budgets of big brands, buy my product, and pay with my payment source as a way to really um, influence consumer and uh, get the word out. Okay, thanks. Have you guys worked at all with building awareness about mobile payments, and is that a big um, part of? Yeah, you know, I think that uh, definitely v vendor, I mean, the trucks haven't had much trouble promoting themselves, and like our work is pretty bounded uh, in terms of doing advocacy with the city, so we don't really work too much to try and promote the association, per se. Um, but uh, that, that same sort of partnership uh, ends up working a, a lot with us. We'll get like MasterCard or to, they've, you know, more than once they're like, oh, it's the end of the quarter, we have an extra $50,000, we want to give her up, like free food, you know, like New York City priceless That's experience. That's a good way to get consumers. Yeah, free, ah. free, free food, long lines, um, and uh, really highlights something special about New York. And so like that, those sorts of campaigns have been really great, sort of working with uh, someone with bigger budget, um, but I'd say by and large, uh, PR has been really tactical and useful um, to sort of bridge the gap in, in uh, sort of the concept of what street food is. Uh, so you know when you can get uh, like 
a New York Times review of a food truck or the New York Times or uh, cranes talking about like the economics of the street, like um, that's that's basically moving the product mainstream and like getting uh, you know this set of branded trucks uh, in front of the community that they're trying to sell to. Okay. Well, and we kind of talked about some third-party partners in various scenarios. I know. Um, some of you rely on kind of payment partners in order to facilitate this mobile payment transaction. So I wanted to hear a little bit from you all about either how you identify those, those kind of relationships, you know, how they function within your business and in, within your app and your product. Go for it. Uh, I, th I think it's extremely important that you offer a choice to uh, your, your customers. So Besides the traditional uh, debit and credit card payment methods, we, we accept PayPal as well. We are directly integrated with them, and uh, it works wonders. Their growth within my uh, customer base is the most aggressive of all. Uh, so I'm very excited about that. And, and there when, are, you, when you mean aggressive, you just mean that's where you're seeing? I see, I see a natural uh, growth. So, so in terms of payment methods, the PayPal growth is fast. It's going faster percentage-wise than uh, debit cre credit card. And as an alternative, we also offer stored value solution, a wallet with Citibank, and we just do that to mitigate the, uh, you know, the effects of the Durban Amendment on, on uh, small ticket transactions. So that's something that we did as a defensive mechanism. Um, and, but it turns out that people like it as well because of the lower cost, we're also able to offer them a little lower rate per transaction. So, so is that, would they fund a, you know, a Park Mobile, like wallet, almost like right. a, a gift card type of. They they fund a wallet that is uh, charged to their payment method on file. Uh, for instance, 25 or 50 bucks, and the first time they start a transaction, just charge to that wallet until it reaches a certain threshold, then it's reloaded again. And uh, so we got a lot of good feedback about that. But again, you know, if you just park two or three times a month, you might decide that it's not nothing that it's for you because you know you don't want to allocate 25 or 50 bucks in that wallet. So we just try to keep choices there and let the consumer prefer. We, we also talked to Google Wallet. We're very interested in that. I think every uh, emerging payment type that is out there and that the consumer prefers, we're willing to, uh, to directly integrate and accept it as a payment method. So um, for Jump Rope, initially, I mean, we just didn't have access to credit, right? And so we had to take anybody that would uh, provide us mer merchant processing capability uh, we used Authorize.net and uh, another merchant processor that helped facilitate the transaction initially. And right now, I mean, if you go on Jump Rope right now, it's not it's not working because we, we're switching the payment pro um, processor to Stripe. And uh, the reason I won't be able to get into the clubs tonight. Then. Not tonight. <laughs> That's, well, you can still do it the old-fashioned way. Um, show some money. Show some. <laughs> yeah, it's what it is, right? It's economic. So. Um, the reason we're, we're switching to Stripe, and uh, we, can, we, we actually talked to Braintree, and they, again, we didn't have this real credit history, so uh, they weren't really interested in us. But um, at the time, we thought, hey, why don't we open this up to anyone in the industry, right? So if you're in the liquor sales business, or even in music, or a bartender, or anybody in the ecosystem that can help facilitate you know, the, you know, access for somebody, why don't we give you the power to earn that? that capital instead of just the nightclub, like the owner, right? And so there are all these players in the industry that can give you access to Fashion Week or can give you access to some Super Bowl party. Uh, it doesn't have to necessarily be a nightclub at a specific location. Uh, we're opening it up to them, and we're going to pay them uh, and move the money from, from, from the consumer you know, through Jump Rope as a path through, and then Stripe will facilitate the payout on the other side. And so we're we're, switch, we're switching that up, and we're rebuilding um, some of the some of the uh, the front end um, to make the U, again UI UX discipline. You have to make it seamless, easy, and enchanting and delightful to use. Otherwise, people will just toss it in, in two seconds. Alex, early on for us, it was really important to be open to all the payment sources. So any token or 16-digit PAN we can accept and process as payment. We also thought it was really important not to require the merchants to have any separate settlement. <laughs> and one of our early payment partners were, was, was PayPal, and they're a great partner of ours still. Uh, and one of the big friction points that they had really getting established offline was requiring merchants to have another settlement account to settle PayPal transactions. 
And um, so it was important for us early on, taking some of those lessons, to not require a merchant to switch payment processors or acquiring relationships to get tabbed out. So whoever you settle with next day, same day, we don't impact that. And whatever card source you want to use as a consumer, uh, we allow that as well. And, uh, and, and that was important. And, and you see um, some of the other startup competitors that tabbed out and that have this current generation and the past generation, all of them required a separate settlement mechanism for merchants. And it's just really hard to get scale there because they're small businesses in our world. Full service hospitality is, is really a, a small business. And they don't have the accounting time and resources to go back and settle two transactions. What were the chargebacks? Who do I call? Where do I go through? It just needs to work seamlessly. And they want, all of them want the same thing. You know, 97, they're used to getting 97% of sales tomorrow. And so we were careful not to impact that at all when we launched. Okay, thanks. And David, I know you mentioned talking about um, Square and other other companies like that. Are they actively, you know, seeking you out, or is this something that you're going out and trying to find options no, for? Um, I would say that uh, so in addition to running the association for uh, food trucks for for vendors, we have an allied membership program where uh, people that are industry interested in the industry can support us, and uh, we provide access to the members, uh, selling opportunities and. The, the community that is the most interested is this payment processing community. And I would say that there isn't a week that goes by that someone doesn't email us. It's usually like some one-off um, guy at a merchant services company. Um, uh, but the, the, the three major players that have come through and made a concerted effort have been Square initially um, providing iPads to the trucks to try out their services, uh, Level Up coming through uh, with their Google partnership, providing, um, again, uh, infrastructure. I think they had Android devices uh, to process off of, and then uh, free $10 transactions. So like, you hand them a coupon, and at that moment, they can buy $10 worth of food for free from your truck, which is great. Uh, and most recently, right now, PayPal's been uh, aggressively trying to convert trucks uh, uh, surrounding and also parts of the community of New York City to create little pockets, um, uh, and they've been giving away uh, a giving lot away more lots of money. <laughs> yeah, so they're they're buying full on POS solutions, yeah. um, iPads, cash drawers, receipt tickets, printers, and uh, that that's had extremely wide adoption because they've basically taken any sort of friction or challenge for the, the trucks out of the way and said, like, here's everything. And on top of it, they're waiving all the processing fees until the end of the year. So like, why not? Everybody's yeah. giving it a try. Well, that's why I was kind of curious, because you all are almost testing out all these various technologies, NFC, you know, the mobile wallets. And so from the merchant perspective, what has been kind of the, the most attractive, what's been, what are, you know, hasn't worked quite so well? So some of the hangups, again, I mentioned earlier for Square, um, the speed of service, it wasn't enough. Um, also, back in 2008, a lot of people were using cash registers. And once people are trained on their cash register, cash register is such a pain to set up, like program each button. But once your staff know how to do it, it's actually much faster than an iPad and like swiping between screens because like a lot of the layouts just there aren't enough buttons for the the number of SKUs on even a food truck which all has a very limited menu. Um, so there was a lot of pushback from the staff where they're like, oh, I can run this transaction in like 10 seconds, and on this iPad I'm like picking, 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 and then doing modifier. Um, and it, I think part of it was, like you were saying before, is the user interface. Like, especially early on, it just wasn't where it needed to be to compete even with the cash register. Um, and then um, more recently, things that we hear that are very persuasive, obviously waiving all the transaction fees and giving free equipment, like that gets people really excited. Um, but one of the things that PayPal's come to market with that's sort of put them over the edge against Stripe has been uh, like 24-hour phone support. So actually being able to call people um, and that human connection. Um, I think especially in hospitality, people like to talk to each other. Um, so that's something that I wasn't necessarily a decision criteria for me, but I've seen like the trucks really loving. That, that's a really good point. I think that's probably something you all deal with as well, is like you have the customer support, but also providing a certain level of merchant support because this is a new technology. And so is that something, how are you all providing merchant support? Is it through you know website? Is it through app or platform? How are you kind of addressing that issue? We have an app 
kind of support. And so if you have any type of issue or problem, you can just you know, fire up a button and then communicate with, with me or someone from the staff. Uh, more often than not, though, people use that to say, hey, you need to get this nightclub on your, on your platform. <laughs> Form, right? Instead, you know, in Atlanta, there's some place called Opera or something. I don't even, oh. right? I mean, I don't remember. <laughs> very, nice very nice Very nice. I haven't been there in 12 years, but people are like, hey, Opera, huge line, would pay a gazillion bucks to get in right now. Get it on your platform, please. Um, and so there's that feedback mechanism. But sure, you have to respond to people. A lot of times it's in and, and look, everyone in the, in the room is probably thinking, well, come on. It's the nightclub scene, right? They're, they're kind of holding you out for a reason. No, they're not, right? It's just kind of like this kind of fake situation there where you really don't, you know, what's the mystery here? Why can't I get in with my brother, you know? They want your money. The guy, the guy or girl who's going to pay the most is, is what, what, what they want. They want you to spend money on alcohol and they want you to spend money on, on, on people or whatever. And so I'm just proving that you're doing, I'm proving that before anyone has even seen you. That, that, that transaction's already done. So what's the next question, right? Um, but yeah, we have, we have support mechanisms. Alex, what's merchant support like at Tabbed Out? Um, man, it's a pain in the neck. <laughs> Number one issue for us is, um, you know, the, the wait staff are just not the best at, like, just network admins. So they think repeatedly just holding down the power button on their POS system is the way to fix all problems. Um, so we have a lot of questions about uh, just refiring all the EXE files that need to sit on a, a POS device. Um, but, uh, but from the consumer standpoint, same thing. It's you know, in-app uh, consumer support. And, uh, and our biggest one is, uh, again, on the merchants, just uh, the systems being down. Systems being down. Well, this is one question where I look at a lot of apps out there. And you know, some of this it may be obvious, sometimes it's not. But one of them, I'm like, how do they make money? You know, mobile payments, a lot of just pure mobile payments, consumers aren't going to pay more money to make you know, a mobile payment. They're used to being rewarded and actually being paid, in a sense, to perform, you know, use their credit card, use various, you know, rewards here. PayPal will give you $10 if you pay with us here and there. So for mobile payments companies, or that facilitate mobile payments, how are you, how do you make money? Oh, well, we are a uh, consumer funded uh, solution. So that means as a, as a consumer, you pay a transaction fee somewhere between 25 up to 80 cents per transaction with an average of about 42 cents. And, and, and it's very simple. We found that you know whether we charge 35 cents or 40 cents, it doesn't matter because people just don't like the issue to fumble around with, with coins and change. So, uh, so, so, that, that, so we have a very robust recurring business model. And also, if you look at partnerships with, with our uh, car manufacturers that we're talking uh, to now for the connected vehicle to make you know, our payment engine a default payment engine within the GPS system of vehicles, there's also a recurring revenue model built in. And we see that it is growing in a way that very pleases us. Yeah, that's interesting. So I think certain industries, consumers may be willing to actually pay an additional fee to make a mobile payment versus other industries they may not be willing to. But it's creating, you know, they're just reducing that much friction. We're like, I don't want to deal with it. So that's interesting that, you know, in parking, it, it, that burden is borne by the consumer. Yeah, I mean, if you, we, we all have a kind of bad experience with parking. So don't tell all the stories after this because I have not that much time, but it is, it is really a, a moment of, of pain. And I think if you're able to identify a moment of pain, just with you waiting in lines in a nightclub while your time is just scarce and you just want to get in, those are the most powerful moments. And yet, at exactly at those moments, people don't care about money anymore. They just want to get it solved right here, right now. And that, I that's guess that's a little do. similar to jump rope probably as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, look, if you're an attorney or a plumber or, you know, you know, a landscape, you know how much your time's worth per hour. You just, you know how to price it, right? Um, emotionally, the rudest thing you can do to somebody is waste their time, right? I mean, you can make more money, you can make more clothes, you can buy more food, whatever. You can't, no one in here can make more time. No one can. And so unless you can invent a time machine, this is, the, this is kind of the best business that I, I think, there's no like product that's changing hands. I'm not selling anything, that should. What, what people buy here is a result, right? It's not a service, it's a result. Did, did, did the result happen? Yes happy to pay for it because this is, that was the price. Oh, that's easy. I'll do it. Um, and a lot of times, that 
you know, the, the fact that you're waiting, it's not in your control. And I think a lot of people emotionally like control. They like control over, you know, how quickly they're going. And, and the, the worst thing you can do is, it's, no, it's out of my control. There's a bus up there crashing into a fire hydrant. We can't take this road. There's a big traffic jam. I'm not going anywhere. Uh, we're working on that. We're working on ways to, to, to solve that problem or, or solve the problem at the airport at Thanksgiving or museums when there's a big exhibit. Or, you know, and, and this thing happened. It, waiting in line it doesn't happen. Like, it's not constant, but it happens all the time. Humans just tend to congregate and do things at the same time, whether it's eat breakfast or drive to work. Um, you know, and this, again, like I said, I didn't invent anything new. This, is, this has been going on since the dawn of time. But at Disneyland, right, you, you take your kids and they're trying to get on some ride. And you're waiting 48 minutes or an hour and a half to get on some ride. Oh, horrible. <laughs> the sheer horror. You'll, the sheer, pay, the you'll pay whatever it takes. <laughs> the sheer horror. horror. So, um, you know, long story short, this is this. It's an exciting kind of area to be in as far as um, uh, making money. It's, it's obvious, right? People will pay, and we we take a cut of that, and we relay, relay and move the rest of the, the um, economics to uh, the person that gave them that access. So. Are, are you talking to Disney now about that? Well, not, not yet. Uh, what, what we're really excited about is American Express, like Black Card, or we're talking, you know, Priceless.com. These experiences uh, for Mastercard that that can provide, you know, people want experiences. At some point, we accumulate enough stuff, right? We got enough things. I've got enough <coughs> clothes. I've got right. I've got enough dishware. But what you what what is priceless is going with your brother, you know, to. I don't know, South America somewhere, and, and hiking, that's experience is, is, is something that people are willing to pay for. Um, and that's, I think, what a lot of people are trying to deliver, right? We're just facilitating that and kind of uh, granting access for people. Okay. Well, I know Tabbed Out has you know, gone through you know, charging a customer to various different models, and I think that that's kind of been an interesting evolution to kind of test, you know, test what works and try and find a way to you know, make money where the consumer isn't necessarily bearing the cost in some of these, like they are, in, they're willing to do in some of these other industries. But, you know, in a restaurant or bar, people are, have, are comfortable paying with their credit card, and so it's going to take them, you know, they're not going to pay extra to, for that convenience necessarily. So I'll make a quick comment, then somebody's putting their um, hands in the air. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, it's, I think there are some businesses that mobile payments will lend themselves to a consumer transaction fee, and I think those are cash-based systems that go to a phone. I think when you're on a card-based system, uh, like the hospitality, you're used to paying your transaction with a card. Uh, the, one of the dumbest things we ever did at Tabbed Out was we started charging people a dollar because we thought it'd be a lot more convenient because they'd just pay a dollar to, uh, to not have to wait for their waitress or waiter. That was the stupidest thing in the world. Um, and, and, and then I read a report on why people will drive, um, spend four or five dollars in gas to save a dollar fifty from an ATM uh, transaction fee if it's not in your network. And it started dawning on us that um, you know charging a transaction fee uh, when you're not on a cash-based system is probably not the way to go. And our number one negative app review still is, man, those guys charge a dollar. We haven't charged a dollar in three years. Um, we make money through partnering with acquiring relationships that go out and make tabbed out a part of their value proposition. And we don't really talk about mobile payments anymore. We talk about how do you get a customer into your database. They just happen to make a mobile payment. So our acquiring partnerships go out and actually sell this on our behalf as a value-added differentiator um, by somebody making a mobile payment. That's how we make money. And uh, as I, I mentioned earlier, brand sponsorships. Buy my stuff, not theirs. Pay with me, not the other guy. Okay, thanks. Well, I, I'm going to open it up to some questions. You, sir? Uh, yeah, let's say Peter uh, helps me jump the rope so I can start recording an hour earlier. And, uh, and Alex lets me stumble out onto the uh, sidewalk 40 minutes earlier before I sober up. And Lauren's helping me figure out what the heck I did with my car. <laughs> <laughs> I can all do it, yeah. There's a, there's a, we have a Find My Car uh, built in, in the app, and a lot of people are using it. I mean, it's a pain if you have a big parking lot and you don't know where your car is parked. I mean, well, that uh, spoils the experience. And one thing, um, there's an uh, RFP coming out from New York in the next couple of weeks. So you will expect mobile payments in New York in the next, I would say, 6 to 12 months. You, sir? Question from Peter. Um, just downloaded the app, saw the catch is coming soon. Sure. Um, I go in there. What, what am I talking to on the back end? Are you integrated with the POS or is it a separate tablet? 
It's a separate, separate transaction. Um, this is, you know, I mean, again, in the beginning we thought about different things we could sell, like coat check or even valet parking or something, but we wanted to remain focused on just that one, that one pain point, which is access, right? I mean, you can figure out what you want to do with your coat, or where you put your car, or whatever. That's not our business right now. Maybe we could expand into that one day um, if our community's big enough, but right now it's just, hey, Catch, how much is it paid? Here's an animated receipt. You show it to the door person, the door person says, right this way. It's that simple and that, because that, the, less, the less moving parts you have in that transaction, you know, the, the less likely you're gonna have a disappointment you know, in that transaction. Again, it's user interface, one button, one touch. Everyone in here has heard of Uber. Um, Uber is very exciting because they just figured it out. They figured out how to call a car with a button and then the rest takes care of itself, right? So, I mean, I'm kind of a student of, 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 of user interface and user experience, and not necessarily even technology. I mean, who knows what's next? I just went to an Internet of Things conference last week about, you know, the light bulbs are gonna, you're gonna start paying your electric bill through the light bulb, right? I mean, the product of the year last year apparently is this light, it's an $85 light bulb, that you screw in, and from your phone you can change the color of the light bulb or something like that, right? And so all these things, that's, that's, that's great, that's cool. There, there are things you can drink that will diagnose what you're, you know? All that stuff is cool and I, I read about that, but what I'm a, I'm a student of is again, the heart. Like what did, how do you feel after you just interfaced with a piece of technology, right? I mean, it's gone on since the dawn, since my grandmother used to ask me to put the VHS tape into the, right, and press play because she didn't know how to do it. Like how do I get my movie? going, right? So it's, it's all about the interface and the experience. Uh, two quick questions for you. Do you charge like a percentage of what the person is willing to pay or a fee? And are you going to include like a cloud score and maybe someone with a higher cloud score or get a, a cheaper rate? Sure. So uh, our, 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 um, the margins that we charge between, you know, it's, it's transparent to you. There's a price there, you pay it you're on with your night. That discussion between what we charge and the margin and what we give to our vendors or our merchants is between us. And, you know, they're, they're healthy. It's right now, they don't complain. It's like, oh, you, you want to give me money just to, okay, I'll do it. So, sounds good. Um, as far as, like, a clout score is concerned, yeah, I mean, everyone's concerned about, um, clout, clout is essentially credit. Right, like what is your ability to be either behave yourself or pay or not charge back or complain or something like that. Yeah, it, we're constantly monitoring uh, our community. We're curating it because that, that, that curated community is worth something to everybody. It's worth something to the NHL or the NBA. It's worth something to the NFL. It's worth something to Neiman Marcus and like I said, all these brands. It's worth something to Walmart. They want, they want quality customers. Everyone wants quality customers. So yes, we keep track of that. Right there. I'm sure each of you are using analytics in one form or the other. Um, since we're talking about payments, the ultimate conversion goal is when the consumer pays money. Mm -hmm. um, have any of you gleaned anything interesting from looking at your analytics or things that were actionable or things that were just funny? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, yeah, I, I have some analytics. Um, in DC, for instance, more than 50% of all parking is going through my app in two years' time, so street parking. So what will happen in DC is that they're going to take out meters from the street and make it pay by phone only. So that is one of the effects that is starting to happen. Um, and, and that means that you, you know, they're going to save more money and they create more revenue. But at the same time, they're going to use all that data that is generated through your cell phone, and they're going to say, okay, now we know how many people parked at a certain time of the street, and they're going to use that to implement dynamic pricing. There you go again. And why is dynamic pricing important? Because it affects us all. 30% of congestion in cities is caused by people like you and I looking for available parking. If you have dynamic pricing with avail and parking availability, then you can mitigate those issues, and you can reduce CO2 emissions. These are the, the real benefits of tomorrow <coughs> that we talk about. I can talk way more about that, but. We ran a $4 off a $5 tab for a certain brand of whiskey in 30 bars in Dallas and Houston. We took um, liver consumption rates, 
of that brand from three to 27% based on $2,500 ad spend. Put an ad in there, say, try this whiskey, not that whiskey. Um, we took it from three to 27%. We took the offer out of the app and uh, usage stayed about 26% consumption rate of that brand from three to 20. So Pretty significant. Wow. People, yeah. people like free drinks. Really good. good for our brand partners. Anybody else? Well, I had kind of one kind of final follow-up question, just, you know, curious, entrepreneurs, startup companies, mobile payments, you know, people have been talking about mobile payments coming forever. And so just kind of want to get your thoughts. One, you know, what keeps you up at night? And, you know, what do you think 2014 is going to bring? I think 2014 will be the big breakthrough of uh, connected vehicles. Um, I see a lot of um, mobile payments, at least in my vertical, uh, going through a vehicle. That makes sense uh, because there are basically two things that you do when you park. You have a vehicle and, you, yeah, we all have a cell phone. So I think the mobile, uh, the mobile payment revolution will continue in the connected vehicle. That, that's what I think. Um, I, I have a couple of companies. One of my companies is called Disruptive Technology Partners. And we're always looking for... Um, to solve these problems. I think a consistent problem in the room, whether we acknowledge it or not, is consumer credit. Right? I can't look at you. I can't look at you and tell whether or not you're a reliable credit or not. And so what we're trying to do at um, DTP is invent uh, a new way, a new way. I, I think re-examine what consumer credit is. What does it mean? Do you, do you really have to have a credit history to be a reliable person, right? Um, if that's the case, I mean, you know, nobody in Sub-Saharan Africa is ever going to get credit because there's no, there's no real history in, in parts, of, parts of that world. But there's certainly reliable people, right? And so it depends on maybe activities or maybe it depends on academic scores or, you know, what you've done. Are you a leader on your, your sports team or something like that? So we're, we're examining that social graph to determine what that consumer credit score, because everybody can use that. You know, everybody wants the best customers. I'm, that's where we're focused on is people that do what they say and say, say what they do. Uh, so that's what we're examining and that's what keeps me up. Mine is, uh, you know, hiring the right people. So, um, you know, we're aggressively growing the company and as you go from just a handful of people to, uh, you pass the startup mortality risk, which uh, never say never that we won't go back there, but um, to make sure that as we scale that organization, you can't touch everybody still, you can't, um, interview everybody still to check their culture and that barometer. And that's, uh, that keeps me up at night of losing control of that as we go from you know, 20 to 30 to 50 uh, people. And, uh, and I think then in terms of 2014, I think um, expectations are largely going to be missed in terms of mobile payments. Uh, I've been around fintech and payments for a long time and nothing moves very quickly in payments. That's true. Um, and so uh, you know, my 11-year-old, maybe he won't have a MagStripe card by the time he's 21. Maybe. But uh, I think there's a lot of hype and um, there's going to be a lot of missed expectations in terms of usage of mobile payments in 2014. Uh, I, I was actually going to say the same thing. Like, on the street, cash is still king. People still use credit cards. Um, level up hasn't transformed things. That people are like waving phones to to like make uh, make those transactions happen all the time. It's like for for you know in in most restaurants or fast fast casual restaurants, you're seeing like two thirds is still cash, and on the street, it's probably even more than that. So I would say that a lot of the investment in uh, mobile food, in particular. I'm not sure it'll substantiate itself, and will everyone, you know, still be using PayPal? Yeah, to process that percentage of customers, but I don't think it's, yeah, it's cash is going to be there for a while. Well, thanks everyone. I think you all are going to be sticking around afterwards if anybody wants to ask questions. And um, yeah, thank you.